How's it going everybody? My name is Falling Hurts and today I want to talk a bit about a game I've been championing for a little while now and kind of put a final verdict to it. And that is Indica. A game that from its first trailer had a lot of people really excited for what the concept could be and ever since I actually played that demo I've been so excited to see just how this game would play out. Now I will say off the rip I was really really impressed with the demo and I was really excited for the full game and I enjoyed the full game. But it has disappointed me in a major, major way. Some of what I'm going to be talking about is fairly subjective. And we'll get into a lot of non-spoilery details about the game and, you know, how it plays out. But just off the rip, I have to say that this game did disappoint me. Although it's a very competently well-made title. There's just aspects of it that I personally did not enjoy. And I'll try to explain why I may or may not recommend it based off of how you may want to play it. Because I do think it's different for different people. That said, your need to know is Indica is a game made by Odd Meter. Previously, they'd only made a VR title, but this is being published by 11-Bit, who have made, you know, The Invincible, The Thaumaturge, they've got Creatures of Ava coming out later, Frostpunk, Frostpunk 2, The Altars, a really significant grouping of games that all really interest me in their own unique ways. So anytime they put out something, I'm really excited to see just where it goes. And quite frankly, from, you know, announcement to release, Indica has been a kind of quick turnaround for a game. And I suppose that's where the double A comes in. But ultimately, it's been one of those things that like a flash in the pan, like, oh, this is so quick. I wonder how it's going to turn out. But this isn't a triple A game, although it does look very beautiful a lot of times. So you're going to be able to pick up the game for $24.99 US dollars tomorrow for PC and later in the month for the Xbox and PlayStation consoles. And I've got to say, with that price proposition, there's a lot to unpack with this game. Because first off, this game took me just a little over four hours to complete. It's a very short game in my opinion. Supposedly the runtime was six to ten hours based off of exploration. But I have to say, I didn't skimp out on exploration. This isn't a game where I just beelined it all the time. Were there a few things I'm sure I missed? Yeah, I'm not always the most perceptive. However, I was actively looking for things to find, collectibles, and maybe even more story details throughout, and while there were some of those things, even though I didn't get absolutely everything, I was trying to make sure I experienced this game in its entirety, and it was still just a little over four hours in my experience. That said, that's kind of my major point, and I'll get into why in just a minute. So I want to break down the game into my usual four categories. The story, the gameplay, the visuals, and the sound design. So from a story perspective, this game is wild. I really don't know what else to say other than the fact that you are Indica, a nun who is outcast at her monastery because she has the devil on her shoulder, quite literally. In the earlier moments of the game, it depicts how, you know, she acts strangely to them and how, you know, obviously they see her as an outsider. It's an alternate universe, 19th century Russia. So, you know, people don't exactly quite know what to think. But interestingly enough, I want to lean really heavily into that alternative universe Russia, because as Indica is given a mission to deliver a letter, she must embark out across the landscape, and you're going to be intertwined into some really unique interactions with different characters, mainly your primary companion, a man named Ilya, which he was in the demo for the game, and he's prevalent through most of this game as well, and kind of acts as the main counterpoint to Indica's character. I say counterpoint because the main point of the narrative of this game is talking about religion and quite frankly the moral ambiguity of sinning and why we do deeds for praise or an example given within the game is if opening someone's letter is a sin and also killing someone is a sin which one is worse is there a worse crime there in the eyes of god and if so how many letters can you open before you're considered a murderer things like this are brought up because as the devil's on your shoulder, he's like putting little thoughts in Indica's ear. And it's a really interesting narrative as Ilya is a character who is from a morally different background from Indica. And at the same time, they have basically the exact opposite views, both of them, from what they should have. And I'll allow the, you know, the nature of that to unfold as you play the game if that's what you want to do. Ultimately, though, I have to say that this game does a really good job of handling the emotions it's trying to give. For instance, there's times where this game is grotesque, there's times when this game is bleak, dull, and there's just a few moments in this game where it makes you think that humanity can do no wrong. Like, there's some great moments where people can come together. Hell, there's even 
a huge emphasis on humor within the game, and I think that works really, really well. Every once in a while, there will be a cutscene presentation where I feel like there's a character here or there, which I know this may be an audio thing, so you can count this here, where sometimes there's characters, minor characters that you've never seen before, acting in a scene, a chase sequence or something, and they're not making any audio sounds, so sometimes that pulled me out a bit, but overall, it wasn't that big of a thing. The other interesting aspect of Indica's journey is that a lot of the flashbacks are actually told in a pixel art, retro-styled game format, and this is as we transition over to the gameplay, we're all focused on first. As you're getting a lot of the backstory of how Indica found herself from a seemingly happy home into the monastery at a young age of like 14 or 15, while that plot is there and it's spread out throughout the story to give you little tidbits of why Indica got to where she got and, you know, how everything came to be, the part that truly made me excited about these sections is that they were always, always really unique gameplay segments. There was one that was basically like Pac-Man, but if you got hit by a certain projectile item that would fling across all the rows, you lost some of your dots, basically. There were others that were platforming where you had to time out, you know, certain platformings going up and down so you didn't fall. And genuinely, I wanted to say that these sections are probably the most challenging within the game, so I was really, really excited about that. But talking about the gameplay as we switch over to the third person perspective where the main game does take place, it's less involved than maybe you might expect. And what I mean by that is you do have puzzles and a lot of these puzzles are actually really smart. Sometimes you've got things that shift perspective as like you walk through a room and you see a mirror of yourself walking out in the other direction. It's really, really cool. And that was one of the more higher up ones as you get further into the game, just as an example of where things can get to. You've also got things as simple as trying to block certain elevators so they line up in such a way that you can actually still get on it once you've made it start moving. And a lot of them are positioning-based puzzles. You need to position the right item, you know, the right crate, or the right can in the right place so you can actually platform and get further on. This is pretty much almost always how the puzzles work in the main third-person perspective of the game. And generally, I want to say that they have a pretty good sense of progression. There was a build-up to each of these puzzles, but as I talk about the short runtime for the game, I want to say that none of these puzzle like ideas, whether it be, you know, the whether it be the perspective shift puzzle or, you know, the can stacking puzzle or the bridge stacking puzzle or even the elevators puzzles there's always something in this game that feels like, okay, I've done it once, I understand the concept, now give it to me again on a bigger, more challenging scale. I feel like any one of these puzzles you should have gotten a second iteration of, and that would have increased the runtime of the game, I think. You throw in some dialogue in between those bits, I think that would be really strong from that sense. Maybe it would have messed with the pacing, I'm not sure every puzzle needed it, but I think that's a place where it could have been. And while we're talking about the actual, I believe, shortcomings of that, I would say, abrupt ending to the game, this is where I kind of get into the problem that there is an ending to this game. It's satisfying and it's not at the same time. It's satisfying in the sense that everything that you may have wanted to happen or have expected to happen does happen. However, there are certain character send-offs for the end of the game, characters you may want to see more from rather than the send-off scene that they got, that were a bit underwhelming. I, I can't lie. You know, I'm not going to speak about it for spoiler's sake, but it's a very tight cast, and you would have hoped to see more than the one-liner they got to leave the area at the end of the game. Regardless, though, the game, from both a philosophical standpoint, as well as a platforming and puzzling perspective, the game surely does challenge the player, and in that way, I really appreciate it, whether it be from difficulty or genuinely asking really, really interesting questions. It's a nice game in that regard, but it's one of those things that it just makes it all the more bitter that it didn't last longer. And I'm not one of those people that thinks that every game needs to be 20 hours. I realize that. But I wasn't speeding through the game, and I still got it done in just over four hours. Well, now, one thing I will say, though, I looked at all the achievements for the game. I didn't 100% it, but the only ones I missed were things that were based off of, you know, solving a puzzle on the first try, or dying five times off the same ledge, or something like that. And in that way, it did make me appreciate and really reflect on the idea that this game has a wonderful chapter select screen in the main menu. Every chapter is broken down individually and very meticulously, so you can go back and, you know, achievement hunt anything you want, 
as well as just the checkpoints for when you die within the game, for whatever reason, are really strong. Now, with that being said, I wanted to take just a little bit more time to talk about the visuals and the sound design, and kind of talk about what I like about the world presented with some of the atmosphere. So first off, this is a very cold and bitter looking game, almost at all times. Whenever you see Idika or you see Ilya, the world always seems unforgiving in a way that it makes you wonder how people don't always cling to a religion in these scenarios. And that way they do. Especially considering in this universe, it's very mystical. There's things that are out of the ordinary. There's things that are far different than what we would expect. And what I mean by that is, as you're moving through these worlds, you'll see a dog that's far too big. And you'll think, okay, that's weird. But then you'll realize that there's even bigger wolves out there. And you'll see things like giant fish that you'll realize are the size of whales, but clearly aren't whales. And the industrial system within the game is built up so big to the sense that it's actually able to handle these giant creatures. And it's in that way that, you know, you've got giant fish factories for giant fish. And it makes for really interesting and detailed environments, especially as you move from one location to the next. You've got Indica's footprints, whether you're in snow, you're on wooden ground, metal ground, different platforms, and pretty much anything else in between that's always going to be reflected in audio, and I think that's always huge in adventure games, because I want to feel a sense of presence within that world. Another nice touch. Another thing about this game that I really liked, Indica is always wonderful to look at. She's always got subdued, you know, facial expressions if you look at her while in third person, and in that way it fits the idea of a semi-possessed nun. But also, even visually from behind, she looks great. I didn't mean <laughs> what you probably think I mean, but, you know, whether it be, you know, her hood for her nun outfit, her sexy nun outfit or whatever you want to say, the uh, physics and the flow movement on it looks really, really high quality. And especially when she's walking around and it's snowing and the snow stays on the hood, you realize that there is a strong attention to detail put into a lot of the smaller aspects of this game. And that's why I can confidently say this game was made competently. They realize that you're going to be spending a lot of time with Indica, so she needs to look great. And she does. The voice acting for this game, whether it be Indica or Ilya or one of the other characters you're meeting along the way, is all really, really good. Like I said earlier, there's a few characters that I feel could have talked in certain scenes when in reality they were just silent. But ultimately, maybe they just didn't want to talk to Indica, and that's just me. And another thing with the soundtrack that I really, really, really loved is you've got this, you know, slower more modern, well, modern in that era of music that was really good. You know, it you know it followed some impactful moments for sure. But when the game started to get crazy and the devil started really making his due, especially in the sequence when he starts berating Indica and, you know, the screen gets all red, you have to actually pray to control him. That's when the game's soundtrack is incredible. It kind of hits this retro theme that uses different notes, different sounds, and it's just off-putting in like the best way possible. And in that way, in those tense moments in the game, as well as those humorous moments, this game has a great handle on how to juxtapose these two genres in a really meaningful way. And I think that was one of the bigger draws from the demo, and I think it even carries over really well to the final game. Overall though, for 25 US dollars, I have to say, I like this game. I really do. I liked what I played, and it just made me hungry for more, and I say that with the best of intentions. Because there's so many aspects of this game that I wanted to love, but it felt like they never hit their full potential. They're, they never came to fruition, and even some of the crazier aspects of the marketing for this game made it seem super crazy, and quite frankly, they just never hit that level after those opening bits of the game, in my opinion. But not seeing how everyone has played the game and how long it's taking other people, Maybe I actually legitimately was a fluke, and being in this early access review period, I can't say that for sure. But I promise you, I was trying to be perceptive, fine-toothing everything in this game, and while I'm sure I missed some, I know I did, that runtime is just crazy, especially when you consider the missed opportunities, both narratively and from a gameplay perspective. I wish this game was more... I, I really don't recommend picking up this game unless it's on sale. I'm not saying like a deep sale, it doesn't need to be like 10 bucks or anything, but unless you're really, really intrigued by the premise, which is great, by the way, 
But if you go in knowing exactly what you're going to get, we'll say five hours of runtime, we'll round it up, then that's up to you. And when I say it like that, I feel kind of crazy even giving it that score. But it's more of the missed opportunity that I'm seeing here when I say that. And that does suck. But in a way, I'm really excited to see what Odd Meter does next because I feel like they could learn a lot from this and, you know, continue on making even more third-person perspective adventure games because I think that is a really nice sweet spot to hit. That being said, my name is Falling Hurts. Thank you so much for watching this video. Consider subscribing. Goodbye.